So uh, thank you everyone that uh, came here today. My name is Tiasha Zaitz. I'm a business development specialist here uh, at Better. I'm also the host of Faces of Digital Health uh, podcast. And a few months ago, I came across the Healthcare Business Women Association and I said, well, this is something that we should uh, check out. And uh, when Joy Rios, who is a trailblazer in the US for empowering and amplifying the words or the efforts of women in the US, said that she's thinking of coming here in Europe and asked me where should I go, I said, well, obviously, come here and we'll do something <laughs> together. And uh, then I uh, went to Urska and uh, the board for collaboration and partnerships and said, well, this is a great opportunity for us to bring uh, more women in healthcare IT also to the HBA. And uh, the idea seemed uh, solid. And I went to Brina and um, Sandra and I said, you know, here at Better, we care so much about uh, inclusion and women, but what if we didn't just talk about this topic only on the International Women's Day? Let's host an event. And they said, uh, sure, we can do that, but we don't have the funding for you know, the whole event. Can you find additional sponsors? And I said, OK. So I called Moita, who's a huge, uh, huge uh, friend and role model to me from Search Infonet, who's also working in healthcare IT. And I said, do you want to do something amazing together? And she just said, tell me what you need. And I was like, yes, OK. And she also said, also call Daria. You know, they, they have a lot of women at Caretronic. Maybe they would also be interested in supporting uh, this event. And uh, I didn't know Daria uh, well uh, up until then. But she uh, was very uh, soon interested in this idea. So in less than a week, we had the venue. We had the money to fund this event. And today, we are here. So uh, again, thank you all the women that came uh, here. And more or less uh, 10 or 15 guys that basically didn't dare not to show up because I bugged <laughs> them so much to come here. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Um, and the point that I'm trying to make is that when women you know, step together, we can do amazing things. The key point of today's event is to network, for us to get to know each other a little bit better from different companies, from different uh, backgrounds. And um, Maria Vutkovic said in one of my interviews that um, every man has either a wife, a partner, a daughter, or a mother. So when it comes to women's health, uh, it's everyone's concern. And when it comes to the impact of women on healthcare, it goes well beyond just women. Because many guys will tell you that they may have had a health problem that they didn't take seriously, and that, that they went to the doctor's office just to get their wives off their backs. So uh, the impact is beyond just us. And with that, I would kindly invite Ushka Lackner, the board member of HBA, to uh, say some welcoming words. And then uh, Tomasz Gorning, the CEO of Better, and Bozidarka Radovic, uh, product lead of Better Meds here at Better, uh, that's hosting the event. Thank you, Tiasa. Thank you, first, for this uh, nice uh, organization and collecting so many guests here. Thank you for organizing and bringing this idea, of course, to HBA. So as you heard, my name is Ursula Lackner. I'm coming otherwise from Pfizer. Uh, but uh, here I am representative of HBA. So HBA uh, stands for Healthcare Business Women Association. The name itself says what does it mean. It means that actually we are including uh, women from all over the world. This is global organization from healthcare business. It's not just from pharmaceutical companies with where they started. And I'm very glad that now today we are not in pharmaceutical company, but we also integrate the other companies who are dealing with healthcare sector. Let's put it like that. Um, the main mission and purpose of Healthcare Business Women Association is um, to bring empowerment in women, to include this, uh, let's say, important topic which majority of uh, broad uh, international companies are doing so, integrity, inclusion, equity, uh, very nice, popular words, but do we really live them? Do we really have all these um, integrated in our processes? So when we are coming, at least I can speak for mainly pharmaceutical companies, when we are coming to some levels, uh, women are very much welcome. We are hard workers, we are in different positions. And even, I have to be very honest, pharmaceutical companies, especially in Central Eastern European countries, uh, are predominantly uh, 
equipped by women, we have to 70 to 75 percent of women being employed, which means that also uh, some higher positions are much easier to be reached than in some Western and other, let's say, U.S. companies. Uh, but coming from our part of the world to some global position and uh, being women and uh, being women from Eastern Europe, it's much, much, much harder. But why? So we face different, different things. So one thing is that, uh, yes, there is a ceiling scene. There is not total integration. There is some blockage in the mindset, mainly, of leaders, of men, male leaders. Uh, on the other hand, what we also face is that uh, we as uh, ladies, as women, we don't dare to try. We are always, um, let's say, thinking we are not good enough. In many positions, and these are research done behind it, in many opening positions, when uh, women take it uh, a look and say, oh, OK, this is OK, this is OK, but the last three topics, I'm not really good at that. This is not position for me. I will never be accepted. Men never think like that. Men always say, this is this, OK, I ignore what I'm not fitting too much, and I go for it. I go for it. Of course, I'm the best. It's uh, just <laughs> coming to the interview, and I will show that I'm the best. They need me. And what we just heard in one recent event was that, yes, when male come to, even with not fulfilled all the requests, he will come and start negotiation about the salary. And women come, maybe I'm not too, bad, too good to that, but I really like the position. This is only the, the, the biggest thing what to do. So HBA is an organization who wants to empower women to really, if your mission and vision and idea and your passion is to develop yourself, to grow, do it. Try it. You cannot lose anything. You can stay without that position, but it's learning experience. At least you learn something. You show yourself. And next time, and next time, and next time, and once you succeed. And also message for male, it's not that women want to be like male leaders. We are different, and that's great. But the best companies has mixed uh, leadership teams. Because this different approach, different thinking, different way of operation like male and female leaders are doing are the most beneficial and these companies are the richest. These companies are the most agile, the most flexible, the most different view. And we are serving with our products all population, so all genders. In general, this is the topic of HBA. And uh, just for your information, HBA in Ljubljana was uh, established last year. So we just recently celebrated first year anniversary. So you, the ones who are following Tiasha probably saw that. So it was a great event. We are welcoming anybody who would like to join, women or men. Please, you are very welcome. We want to build this society and build it broader to the other industries as well so that we really understand what is the benefit of mixed leadership teams. And with that, I would also like to thank very much to Better that actually uh, host us here. Uh, and of course, big, great thankful for Tiasha that uh, invited such a uh, honorable guest. And I'm really looking forward to what we will hear today later on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, at Better, we are extremely proud to be able to host uh, this event. Uh, what we do here is uh, we are a digital health company. We build uh, software, namely digital health platforms, which are uh, used in uh, many different uh, scenarios uh, in care coordination, in uh, shared care records, uh, in the medication management. Uh, we work in uh, uh, globally, mostly in, in Western Europe and 21 countries. Uh, and uh, we have uh, over 120 customers now which uh, use uh, our, our platform. Uh, the, um, the issue here is, is quite important to us. Uh, and it's not just because we feel it's the right thing to do. It's also because it improves uh, business outcomes. We firmly believe that with uh, diversity, different points of views, different styles of communication, uh, different um, uh, approaches, talents, uh, we can build better products. Uh, and I'm proud to say that uh, we are now up to almost 38% uh, women in our company. 
Uh, I was just talking this morning with somebody that it differs by floors, which is interesting. Uh, the top floor is still uh, predominantly male, but uh, the, the, the others are actually 50-50, if not the other way around, uh, which, is, which is extremely uh, good to see, and we intend to, to uh, uh, improve in that uh, going forward. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bozidaka. Thank you very much. Good morning from my side as well. So Tomasz presented what our company is doing, and I wanted to introduce you to one of our core beliefs that sits in heart of our organization, and it was mentioned by Tiasha before, and it, well, it uh, aligns very well with today's event, and that is we care. And when we say we care, for us this goes beyond mere words. It's actually a true foundation of everything we stand for. We care and we are committed to our customers. We are committed to developing the innovative products. We are committed to developing and delivering the best possible solutions. But this commitment extends further to, of course, our employees. And we demonstrate this value by promoting the environment in which those topics like inclusion, diversity, and equity are very important, promoted, and cherished. Now, when I say equity, I don't mean just like a buzzword that we are all used to it. Um, for us, it's more of a, let's call it a guiding principle. So we are very aware that in order to reach equality, it's not enough to treat everyone the same way, but we have to give the access to the opportunities individuals need in order to succeed. And we believe that this understanding of uh, fairness is actually helping us um, uh, and helping every individual working with us uh, be better and um, regardless of any socio-demographics or gender criteria. And that being said, uh, diversity is al also another cornerstone of our philosophy. We are working a lot and we are investing a lot into building diverse communities because we are sure that diversity is the key for growth, for learning, and for broadening I, uh, our horizons. So uh, with diverse communities and environment, we can actually build not only better products and better company, but actually we all can be a little bit better. Um, and with that said, um, we are very proud to host this event today in our offices. So thank you, Tiasha, and all who joined the event today. Uh, I'm sure that you will fi find the presentations today very informative, uh, and hopefully it will inspire you to uh, promote and work on these topics even more in your organizations as well. Um, and maybe at the end, let uh, me just remind us all that uh, collabor collaborative efforts or our mutual efforts is what can actually make um, changes and enrich not only our industry, but also the world. So thank you and enjoy the event. Uh, one of the key goals of today's event uh, is basically two things. We are going to talk about women's health uh, in the upcoming discussion, but before that, we have Mariana Pickett uh, from Infonet, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview of basically um, inspiring things from the female perspective in healthcare IT in Slovenia. So I will give the word uh, to her, and then we'll continue. Uh, dear guests, my name is Mariana Pickett. As a computer engineer, I am the assistant manager at Search Infonet. Our company, has been operating for 34 years. Uh, we are leader in digitalizing healthcare processes in Slovenia. The field of health IT is very sensitive and requires a lot of empathy, collaboration, and keeping up with the development of IT technologies. It is essential to ensure the highest standards of quality and precision in everything we do, from data management to the development products and platforms. Here, women's characteristics such as dedication, adaptability, commitment to collaboration, and attention to details become noticeable. Briefly something about my story. I have been part of this company for almost 30 years. Uh, the company's co-founder, co Miljana Slavic, became my role model and mentor. With my technical knowledge and desire to contribute, I quickly became well acquainted with the health IT domain and soon began contributing 
to the development of this very important field myself. At that time, other similar Slovenian companies was established. Uh, for example, List, Nova Vizia, uh, Marant, now better, uh, Pina, Kertronic, and others. And a lot of women, such as Miriam Karpanica, Kiosica Liskošak, Daria Pichnik, <coughs> Daria Perko, are also prominent at these companies. Also, Tjasha Zaitz and Moica Cviran are always confident co-speakers in this field. All of them have contributed actively to this domain, also to the platform for digital transformation, the Helday.se, and are supporters for, of the Slovenian movement on AVI. Let me highlight the commitment to collaboration. Companies working in this field, although competitors, actually collaborate a lot and have developed respectful and friendly relationships. This is also true with cooperation with national institutions. Our common trait is that we all care about Slovenian healthcare. I believe that the role of women in this field has been indispensable if not crucial, because of this collaborative nature. Over the decades, we have made truly significant steps. I think that greater than in other IT sectors. Let me highlight a few milestones in healthcare digitalization on a national level. For example, health insurance card and health or personal insurance ID. This was one of the most important foundation for healthcare digitalization. Um, patient portal for access to medi medical documentation. Development of central patient data registry, which serves as an umbrella for all IT solutions in healthcare. E-prescription, one of the most successful projects in e-health, and other, a lot of other e-health solutions. The development of, this, of these solutions was carried out on a national level in collaboration with us, with us IT server providers. I was actively involved in, involved in all these projects, collaborating with other women such as Katarina Kral, Anka Bolka, Heidi Kosednar, Lucia Tepejocic, Biser Kasinčić, and the ones mentioned earlier. In parallel, we developed IT systems that operate in healthcare institutions, and today we enable fully digitali digitalized treatment processes, such as, for example, the queue system management for automatic admission, bedside computing, digital clinical pathways, and solutions for communication between patients and doctors. There, was no, there were no national guidelines on what and what needed to be developed in these areas. We relied on our no own knowledge on the domain technology and healthcare processes, and we worked closely with individuals, health professionals. Of course, we often asked ourselves, are we de developing the right products? Are we developing the right platforms? Are we developing them correctly? If you look at the entire health IT field in Slovenia, we are leader in Europe and beyond. The level of digitalization in healthcare institutions is significantly higher than in other countries. Doctors and patients have 24-7 access to medical documentation. So I can answer, yes, with collaboration, knowledge, and perseverance, we have brought the domain to an inviolable level. What lies ahead of us? Uh, first, a completely different way of working, thinking, developing. Artificial intelligence brings us unlimited possibilities in information retrieval, the creation of complex algorithms, diagnosing, and much, much more. Learning will be something entirely different, different in the future compared, but compared to what it was before AI. Women will also play an important role 
in this, as even more, more collaboration, empathy, and caution will be required in this very, very sensitive field. And there is not, no need to compare ourselves to men, because we already know that we are more versatile and see the bigger picture. Uh, so I think that we must work together, and only together we will be the best. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Now I would invite uh, Joy Rios to join me for a discussion. Um, so Joy Rios is from the US. She has been recognized by him as basically the change maker. She received the change maker award in 2023 for her effort in amplifying the voice of women. And I actually decided that we're not gonna talk as much necessarily about the discussions that we usually have about how many men or how many women should be in companies, but we're actually gonna focus on women's health, which is a field that's not, uh, that's kind of in, in the process of discovery. So um, just to, to kind of uh, set the scene a little bit, and since you know how they say, um, you can trust in God, but everybody else should bring data, I'm just gonna <laughs> present a few things to highlight what ex actually are we talking about when we're talking about women's health. The immediate uh, kind of associations are usually uh, applications and solutions for menstrual uh, health uh, and uh, just tracking your cycle. Clue is one of the most successful companies in Europe in this field. Then there's uh, LV, another really successful European company that focuses on uh, the pelvic uh, floor training and uh, breastfeeding pumps. And then, uh, yeah, that's uh, another different um, company doing uh, a similar thing. There's a ROSI that basically focuses not just on OBGYN um, issues, but also sexual health and things that we are kind of uncomfortable talking about. And this is something that's really changing with the field of, um, of uh, yeah, women's health. Uh, discussions about longevity and uh, ovarian health and how that basically impacts uh, aging. Uh, or, for example, two gynecologists from Charité Medical University Centers uh, designed an app for um, rape victims because what usually happens is that they come to the ER, they don't know what to do with them, they go to the police uh, office and they don't know what to do with them and you only have 72 hours to collect evidence if you want to prosec uh, prosecute uh, the uh, sex offenders. So these are kind of all the solutions that are uh, being developed in the field of women's health. The majority of women working in healthcare, uh, uh, people working in healthcare are women. Women make uh, the majority of decisions in, in families. However, historically only 4% of R&D budgets uh, went into topics specific to women. In drug development, inclusion of women in clinical trials has improved, but that hasn't been the case in um, the medical device space. This is actually a very recent article from two days ago. YAMA research showed that basically one third of women is involved in um, basically uh, clinical studies for medical device uh, trials. There's uh, sexual health issues that we actually just don't really talk about, know about. Doctors don't know about it, so they don't know what, what to tell patients. And uh, uh, menopause is something that we don't want to see as a disease, but we do want to put more research into it so we can understand it better and manage symptoms easier. So I mentioned that uh, yeah, the research field is still in its very early stages. Um, and um, the kind of uh, sad thing that I hope is going to change is that um, now the field of femtech is growing, but obviously the female VCs can identify with female uh, problems more easily, so they're more eager to fund these companies. However, research shows that if a woman funds the first round of a company, that company is going to have a harder time raising the second round because there's this inherent bias that the first round wasn't based on merit but on some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer support. But we're talking about these things and also even though the digital health funding is falling in the last few years, if you look at the investments in femtech inside this whole field, it's actually increasing. Uh, and it's not just about all the problems that I mentioned before. 
so it's also realizing that because we haven't studied the biology of women, we don't know a lot of things. We don't know why 80% uh, of uh, patients with autoimmune diseases are women, that basically cardiovascular diseases present differently in men and women, and that basically dementia and Alzheimer's are more prevalent in, in women. So this is something that we basically need to address, and this WAM report also showed that by investing 350 million in women's health, there's a potential 40 billion US dollars uh, uh, ROI on uh, yeah, investment, which is a huge return on investment. So this is why uh, this topic is uh, important to talk about. Uh, in Europe, there's a Swiss organization called the Women's Brain Project that's in, uh, basically a foundation investing in this research because the problem is that not all clinical trials are uh, nationally funded. And what I'm basically saying is that um, this is not necessarily very, uh, uh, so research is not necessarily profitable or straightforward from the beginning. So we need policies, we need awareness to actually know that we need to invest in these things a little bit more. And this brings me to Joy uh, Rios uh, and to our discussion. So uh, Joy, tell me first of all, uh, how did you actually get into healthcare and how did you went for he from healthcare IT to then uh, founding a Hit Like a Girl? Well, first of all, thank you all for having me and thank you for speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my entry into healthcare was, I took the long path. It was not a straightforward thing. I didn't get to it until I was about 30 years old. I started in, as an English major. I went to go get my graduate degree. I studied um, sustainability for, as part of my master's in business administration, but really with a focus on social and environmental and how can we look at how corporations can do well, but also do good, you know, do well by doing good. And uh, I had been working for a solar startup. I honestly thought that I was going to be in the, uh, a solar utility scale solar for quite a while until I got an invitation to join uh, my uncle's document management company that had been, coincidentally, I'd been part of since I was a kid, but without realizing it. And as I got older and I had this experience with a startup, this solar startup, um, he invited me to join. And it was in 2010 and a time when policy was changing. It was the American Recovery, like Re Reinvestment and Recovery Act, where they put billions of dollars and set aside about $60 million for the implementation of electronic health records. And having been new to the industry, I did a lot of research. I didn't know anything about it and wanted to know why doctors should move from paper into electronic. So I went in to my English major mind and basically studied the policy. And I went down and just like, how can I understand what the policies are, why it matters, and what are their implications? And that has served me well because it, and it essentially Oh, there we go. There we go. Hello. <laughs> there. So it essentially helped me learn um, about why we would be implementing how, what was in it for doctors. And then it, 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 it translated into me writing curriculum and then eventually going, traveling around the country into different, all over the, all over the United States going into independent medical practices and then teaching them about those laws. And not only what do they need to know about those policies, but how is it going to affect their reimbursement rates? What kind of training do they need? And it essentially felt like being a data accountant, like a tax person, because ultimately the government wanted this information on an annual basis. And so we're collecting healthcare data, quality metrics, how they're using their electronic health records, and that essentially was scored in a way that turns into their reimbursement rate for Medicare, which then gets copied by commercial insurance. And anyway, it's quite complicated. And for people that already have a complicated job, it's hard to keep track of. So my job get to be like, hey, here's this maze. I'm going to help you through the maze. <laughs> And how did you then get into, you know, amplifying women's voices? What, what exactly, why did you choose the name Hit Like a Girl uh -huh. for, for the podcast <laughs> and for the community? 
Well, after, after several years of traveling around and supporting these medical practices, I also would go to a lot of healthcare conferences, and I recognized that a lot of the people that I was experiencing and working with were women, like you guys have mentioned. However, when I'd go to conferences and summits and whatnot, the people that were up here on stage were most often men. And it just wasn't connecting. I was like, how is it possible that there's all these women doing the work, and yet we're not learning from them? We're not asking them about their expertise. We are not gleaning the wisdom that they have. And I had read some statistics about amplification and why it matters to speak about other people. It's not to say, hey, I'm the best at this thing. If I, if I were to introduce myself and say, I'm really good at this thing, you might not believe me. You might think that I'm arrogant. But if I say, or if Tiaja says, she's really great at this thing, it's more effective. And so I decided to turn that into the podcast and so that I could create a platform of literally just saying, do you know about this woman? She's incredible. Let's hear about all the things that she knows. And so I very intentionally only invite women to, the, to be on the podcast. And it is called Hit Like a Girl, Health IT Like a Girl, um, to kind of reclaim that feeling of what it means to be, to do something like a girl. And I think that, well, I know that we have a connotation that that means, oh, if you run like a girl, you're running slower or maybe more awkwardly or something. But I wanted us to reflect, and I wanted to create a place where we could reflect, why do we think that? Because women are strong, women are capable, they're perfectly you know, experts in their fields, and if they're doing something like a girl, then it is actually the opposite of weak. It's actually quite strong. You actually reminded me of uh, a research that I read uh, around, you know, the differences um, between men and women and how we negotiate, but not just how we negotiate, also how our negotiations are perceived. So, for example, uh, a job interview was mentioned earlier by, by Urska, and uh, in re this is research talking, not me. But, like, research shows that if a woman is going to um, negotiate for a salary, she's going to be seen as kind of, oh, someone difficult to work with. It, in contrast to a man negotiating for a salary, it's going to be perceived as, oh, this guy is going to, you know, uh, kind of bring money into the company. And also, um, basically, uh, as you said, um, women are, like, uh, in research terms, women didn't achieve higher salaries in negotiations when they were negotiating for themselves, but uh, were much better at negotiating when they were negotiating for uh, someone else. Um, going back maybe to, to uh, women's health more specifically and the fact that we need to kind of put more money into this research, two big things happened in the US uh, this year, mm -hmm. a lot is happening. One was in uh, February, I think, so in the beginning of this year, uh, a White House initiative was established to basically put more money, 100 million US dollars, uh, into research about cardiovascular Alzheimer's disease. Um, endometriosis and other health uh, issues. W what kind of discussions do you see after this initiative and what does this signify uh, in the field? Well, I think that one of the things is that an it's an acknowledgement of historical neglect. We really have not been, like, the female body has not really been studied in history in our clinical research and so we have we're lacking a lot of data about why women have these you know um in, imbalance of alzheimer's disease and they you know present in all these other areas pain is ex experienced differently and we don't know why so it's a lot has happened there's been a lot we've lost some rights you know of course i'm sure you're aware that the row got overturned and so we got we lost the right for women to get an abortion, but then other women's health issues are coming up kind of as a response to that. And so in a way that's a good thing because $100 million unfortunately isn't that much. There's another push to put a, an additional $200 million towards it from a different set of funding. And then also um, Melinda French Gates, has just announced a $2 billion that she's putting towards um, removing the barriers that women face. And so that also affects um, how we show up in our health. So I don't know, it's, um, yeah. can you all hear me, by the way? 
Yeah, okay. yeah. It's not that big of a room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is this? Yeah. Okay. It's working. <laughs> um, so uh, another thing, basically, since we're you know kind of diving a little bit into politics, another thing uh, also happened a few weeks ago, and that's uh, a new pack on women's health. Uh, so can you explain a little bit what a pack is and uh, well, everything sure. that happened around it? So in the United States, we have political action committees, and you, we also have super PACs. That might be a, a term that you might be familiar with. And essentially, it's when a group of people com, come together, and they decide what they care about. So they are funders, they are donors, and they raise money to put towards candidates that, uh, that care about the same things that that committee believes in. And so for the first time ever, um, a women's health political action committee has been formed um, to just focus on all of women's health. And so it's across, across the country, we're collecting money and to, uh, identifying candidates who align with supporting the research and funding and you know um, ad advancements of information in women's health. And the interesting part about it is it's kind of a difficult thing to get bipartisan support on anything right now in the United States. We're very divided in a lot. And the way that they have been able to create that bipartisan support is to actually focus on all of the aspects of women's health except abortion. So they have carved that out so that they're, they said that there's plenty of other organizations that are, are addressing and focused on you know, that particular issue. But there's so many other health issues that women face that they deserve just as much attention. And so that's what that, poli that political action committee is um, working towards. And it's great to see advancement and just like a collection of people saying, yes, this is important. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the abortion rights uh, because it trickles down to the economy and the options that women basically have. So at the moment, one in five women in the U.S. has to go into another state to get um, an abortion. And basically what I'm kind of, uh, what I am most um, angry about, I will say, or in just uh, hurt about as a woman looking at what's happening in the US is the fact that you know abortions are being banned but women are not getting any additional support if they do get a child and need to raise that child and um, yeah it just is a huge economic uh, impact do you see also any uh, impact that this has on startups on uh, digital health companies i mentioned earlier that you know a lot of companies focus on menstrual cycles or on digitally tracking or trying to um, be, uh, basically go to through natural contraception um, interestingly enough uh, while abortion is now uh, getting more and more restricted Last year, FDA in January uh, made um, uh, contraceptive pills available over the counter, so you don't need a prescription anymore. But now there's coming restrictions for abortion pills. So um, yeah, there's a lot going on. What do you see in terms of the impact on startups or initiatives that are kind of trying to mitigate this? Well, I'll start by saying there's a lot to be mad at. So yeah, there's a lot to that, that, that is upsetting. And one thing that I feel like we're exacerbating problems, the US already has what we call maternal deserts. And there's areas where rurally, or like there's not actually, they're not critical access hospitals where women have to already, before this even happened, had to travel either out of state or hours and hours and hours to get the care that they would need. And one of the difficult aspects about trying to navigate it is that the rules are different in every single state. And so, you know, trying to, where there's 50 of them plus some territories, and so what might be breaking the law in one state, you travel, you know, two states over and it's perfectly fine. But when we talk about how do you, the technology behind that, how do we secure data? If somebody is getting care, what, how their documentation, what gets shared and what stays private? Who has access to that? Because unfortunately, they're now, um, punitive damages where people can actually, the, the physicians can go to jail, patients can be punished and go to jail. And the part that is scary is for things like, I always bring it to um, 
an ectopic pregnancy. So when a, when when a when, a, when an embryo is in a fallopian tube and is not viable, you know, they are creating policies in states like Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, et cetera, where the women's life may be in danger. There's no possibility for that baby to survive, and yet it is illegal to give them medical care. So some of the digital health apps that I have seen, there is one that has taken, um, and it's a bilingual, it starts actually in Spanish, and it's modeled off of supporting people in countries like Venezuela, where they don't have access to anything, but they need to be able to support women to either self-abort or like, have people within their community help them and get access to information where they, they could get the treatment that they need. And so it would be digital, and that, that is one interesting thing. Um, there's also, you know, may, more telemedicine and the ability to get care, you know, virtually and have mail-in prescriptions so that they can, but, and that was something that was passed during COVID because it made sense that if people couldn't be there in person that they could get their prescriptions, you know, through the mail. But even now that is being taken away. And a little bit about the, it's affecting, um, contraception, there it's even affecting IVF treatment. And so one of the things when we think about like abortion being supportive of families or like of, of choice, families that are going through IVF treatment are finding themselves in a pickle because of the way certain folks are defining what is human life. And so if if you have an embryo, if a family is trying to get IVF treatment and they have 40 frozen embryos, but only one of them is gonna become a baby, the state of Alabama is now leading the charge that if you dispose of those other 39, you, you're essentially aborting, and then that can have legal action. And then now you're gonna be punished for that. And it is wild. It is like the, it's a wild and crazy reality of trying to navigate that if that's the truth in Alabama, then if it gets passed in one place, it can easily spread in others. And how do we, how, like that puts doctors, nurses, medical staff in danger because they don't want to necessarily provide those services for fear of being punished. And how do we do the best, do no harm? And it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a maze like no other. And so I think that there's a lot of digital health companies that are trying their best and it's sort of like, okay, well, if, if we can't do this, let's figure out what we can do and support in those ways. And it just seems like, okay, well, then the folks decide that that is a problem and we just keep pivoting. And, you know, and, and I'd like to say that good is gonna come all of, out of all of this, but it is, it's enraging, to be honest. It's, it's frustrating that we're here right now. If we try to um, maybe uplift the mood a little bit, <laughs> what has inspired you lately yeah. when it comes to you know, women's health or kind of more broadly? Well, I would start by saying one, I'm going to stick on one more sad thing one. It's like decision makers and the men who are often in charge of writing policy, creating rules, and putting, writing checks of deciding where funds go, when they're not understanding the effects and consequences of those decisions and the human lives that that affects, you know, it, it impacts all of us. And it's very, very dangerous. Um, the thing that has been inspiring me, and so one thing I geek out on is policy. And I moved to Mexico about five years ago, and I've got my dual citizenship. And this last election, I had an opportunity to vote. And this was the very first, I, I got to vote for the first female president in North America. So Mexico beat both Canada and the United States in accomplishing that goal. And as I was doing my research on the candidates, and this is the thing, both candidates for president were women. So it wouldn't have mattered who I voted for, either way a woman is gonna win. And to your point earlier, this whole idea of imposter syndrome of just like, who knows if she's gonna be a great president. She might be a mediocre president, but there's been plenty of mediocre men presidents, so I'm wishing her luck. <laughs> like, I think it will be, like, I'm excited for it. 
But in pulling back why and how this happened, it, I, I found and discovered that it had to do with a change in policy in Congress, in the Mexican Congress in 2019. They made it that by law for any political party, so from the federal, state, judicial, any part of the legislator, you know, any candidate, a woman needs to be on the ballot. And so since then, 50% of the Congress members are now women. And mayors of big of mayors of Mexico City, mayors of the town that I live in, on both sides are are both women. And when I was looking at and again the candidate, like on both sides, it had to be a woman. So it took five years. It took five years to change the equation, and it's a massive change. So I'm excited to see how how. That's one of the things that I'm like. Oh, I didn't think that moving to Mexico would actually. I would find myself in a more progressive place. Like that, that math didn't add up. But it's really neat to see that that's been the result. And I'm hopeful that, you know, just understanding of how policy can affect and drive change, we see that in action. Hmm. Maybe just to explain that a little bit more. So women just had to be on the ballot. It's not that this was a quota that they had to be, that, like how many women, but just like at least one or what? Well, there's multiple parts in the U.S. You know, for any any position that's out there, it doesn't mean that you have to put. If for it, if you're going to have candidates on the ballot from any political party, then if they're going, if they're going to rec recommend uh, four people, two of them need to be women, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, since uh, we are, uh, yeah, I want the audience to have time for questions and also to network a little bit because this is also the core thing why we basically came here. Um, you talk to a lot of women that work in business. If somebody wanted to start a business, uh, like what are the key three things that you would advise mm. them to do? I have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> No, I would say first is if you're starting a business in healthcare, health IT, identify areas that are not yet being worked on. I mean, that there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Identify like if all of your peers are focusing on this, you know, focus on the one thing that isn't being focused on so that there's opportunity and more opportunity there. I think women are challenged by finding by getting funding, but ultimately by if you are in a position to start something, don't be afraid about the regulations and compliance, especially in healthcare. Bringing that in as part and understanding how it affects your product is something that is uh, really, really valuable. It'll work in your favor more so than not. And then I'd say lastly, community. I, I, there is so much value in finding your peers, people that are passionate about the things that you care about, and that want to see you succeed. And I think that, that, you know, I started a podcast, but it has grown into much something much bigger, and really the community of just becoming visible, like sh not being afraid to speak up, showing yourself so that others can see you, and that, that way you're in a position to make connections, leverage what you know, and, you know, complement each other's strengths. And, and, Ultimately, you know, we've, we've touched on it before, but the collaboration aspect of when I see my peer succeed, I don't take it as a failure. It doesn't mean you succeeded, so I lost. It's no, absolutely not. You succeeded, which means you opened the door for me to follow in your footsteps. And really trying to consider each of our wins as a collective win, um, ultimately. Um, Joy, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, there's this, uh, I guess, joke that behind every successful man, there's a woman rolling her eyes. I would say that uh, behind uh, every successful woman, at least now, there's a community of women that are basically rooting for her. So I would again like to thank, thank to all the women that basically helped us get here today and help with organization, with funding and with everything. And uh, uh, with that, I would kind of close our discussion. Do we have any additional questions or anything that anyone would like to add to this? Uh, Slovenians are, are pretty shy, so I'm sure that there's <laughs> going to be a huge debate uh, like in the networking part. 
And so uh, thank you everyone again for, for coming. And now let's you know, say everything uh, that's on our minds uh, when the cameras are off. <laughs> <laughs>